So up next, we have Lead 2020, the Evo Business Leader's Guide to Thriving in This Decade, moderated by tech entrepreneur, humanitarian, and founder of Startup 52, Chike Ukegi. Hey, Laura, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank awesome. you for having me today. As uh, as Ndebanya guys, Semamanwo, that's from Amuzukwi Beku in Omoaha. Correct. Right? Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, so do I take it over now or? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, it's, um, it's great to be here today. Um, Happy New Year to so many of you out there. And um, I hope everyone is staying safe and, um, you know, protected from COVID. Uh, for those of us who have lost people, um, our condolences, I hope that, you know, God in his infinite mercy will continue to protect us. Um, however, as we know, as they say, you know, as long as there is life, there is hope. Um, and part of our discussion this afternoon uh, was centered around businesses. You know, one of the wonderful things that I am excited about. So technology, education, and entrepreneurship. Uh, with me today are three wonderful, wonderful entrepreneurs, pace setters, you know, you name them, um, that I'm looking forward to having this conversation with. And I hope that you all engage with us in um, asking them questions on how to build our businesses, how they have stayed successful, and um, how they've survived COVID, and of course, um, what they think uh, people should uh, do moving forward. Uh, so first and foremost, I will introduce, um, I'll actually let them introduce themselves, but I'll give you guys you know, a single liner so that I'm not talking too much. Um, we start with the lady, uh, Vivian Waka. Vivian is the CEO and founder of MedSAP. And of course, if I pronounce anything wrong, feel free to correct me, right? Vivian, uh, MedSAP is a one-stop shop for healthcare stakeholders to purchase, manage, and track medications. And we all know in, in the day and year of pandemics and COVID, um, this is extremely important. Uh, Vivian has also managed political campaigns in Chicago, Illinois, um, and has done several, of, uh, several other wonderful things. Um, so please join me in welcoming Vivian Waka today. Vivian. Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing? Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I, I do want to share a part of the story I never get to talk about, which is the impact of joining in Chicago UIA and, and talking about the Move Me Back, you know, um, movement that was, you know, that we were talking about back in 2011 and 12 and the excitement of doing something to impact Nigeria. And it all started from attending conferences like this and just having conversations about you know, how you can just do something. Uh, so again, thank you all for having me here. Um, so I, I think my story is, is very much so aligned with that, with that beginning, which is that, you know, I didn't really know much about Nigeria, and, you know, growing up, and I wanted to be part of a success story about Nigerians. Um, so packed up and on the September 11th flight of 2013, I landed in Lagos without any real clue as to what I was going to do. Um, and, and, but my point of getting to Lagos was to see how can I create an impactful company that can be a legacy, that can be something that I leave behind, that solves crucial problems, not only in the Nigerian context, but around the world. Um, and so that's how I got to MedZap. Um, unfortunately, um, a friend of mine actually died from taking a fake malaria pill in Lagos. Um, and that opened my eyes to this idea that the value of life in Nigeria is very, very low. 
you can go to a hospital, you can go to a clinic, and you don't actually know if what you're being dispensed is real or not. And it was from that, that moment, that tragedy, that I just started kind of digging a lot deeper. Um, and of course, I'm not a pharmacist, I'm not a doctor. I had just gotten out of business school. I started a solar company. So I was starting to learn um, entrepreneurship in my own context, in an, an African context. But, you know, I just decided that it's just not fair um, that, that, we that our people live like that. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it was that focus um, on the fact that this is not a way to really survive and live that allowed me to find the answers that I needed to find in order to build my company. Um, okay. so maybe, Don't uh, answer all the questions yet, because yeah, I haven't hold it. I'm, I'm answering the questions, aren't I? <laughs> Sorry, but that's how I got here. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Awesome. So next is uh, Charles Opaleke, who is a serial entrepreneur um, that has been successful in entertainment and media and branded. Uh, many of you know of uh, Play Network. Um, so Charles, please uh, jo join our panel and um, I will give you guys, after I introduce the third person, you know, um, about a minute or so to give us a little bit more detailed introduction of who you are. So Charles, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Charles Opaleke. I'm the CEO of Play Network. Um, I'm here to contribute my experience as a business leader. So hopefully my experience helps someone out there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and then last but not least, we have uh, Nam Dunwoke. I hope I have that correct. Nam Dunwoke is an award-winning corporate leader who has worked with several, several uh, Fortune 500 companies from IBM to Adobe to Viacom. Uh, he's currently the head of U.S. Growth and market, Growth Marketing at SAP and founder and CEO of Suede Group. Namdi, are you here with us? I am here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. All right. Ndewo, everyone. My name is Namdi Woke. Okay, thank you, UIU, for having me. Uh, and uh, thank you for that gracious introduction. Uh, like you said, my name is uh, Namdi. I, uh, by day, I'm responsible for U.S. marketing in the, uh, in the U.S., for one of SAP's businesses. So to give you guys a scale of what that is, um, you know, uh, we are a multi-billion dollar business in revenue every year. Uh, and I have about half a billion dollars in revenue responsibility. Uh, so vastly more than my other uh, country counterparts. So that's by day. Uh, I, like, like you said, you know, I've, um, I've had an extensive career in, in corporate America. Uh, previously, I was uh, the youngest and only black, uh, you know, uh, C-level leader at a publicly traded company at Green Sky, where I ran all of marketing, uh, $5 billion business there. And I'm also a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I, uh, I'm a co-founder and investor in a small film studio called Madison and Greenwich, where we work with Viacom, Universal Music Group, Discovery Channel, uh, Frito-Lay, Samsung, currently working with Apple, you name it, right? We've, we've done a ton of stuff. And also my wife and I are co-entrepreneurs in a business we successfully sold uh, called Healthcare Medicine of Atlanta, which is uh, uh, a mobile medical practice for seniors servicing uh, the Atlanta community. So I'm happy to be here with you guys and uh, I hope my experiences can lend uh, someone uh, uh, you know, something valuable today. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I mean, anybody who knows Igbo people, on your will mind my dad's now. I now will carry pace setters. Sometimes people are surprised I can speak Igbo, but listen, I took Igbo in Wayek. In fact, I had A1, so you all should not mess with me. Um, <laughs> so, so here's the thing, right? Um, Vivian as well was the youngest, I believe, manager at uh, Wells Fargo uh, when she was there. You were the youngest at, you know, Green Spring, if that's what you called it. Um, so there are so many um, uh, records that our people get to set. But I always say this, right? Um, what, what makes a successful entrepreneur is usually what drives you, 
people think entrepreneurs just find problems and find solutions to the problems to create opportunities, blah, blah, blah. But behind all of that is usually something that drives you to go from just entrepreneur to becoming successful entrepreneur. Um, I want us to discuss that very briefly, right? So in 30 seconds, what is it that drives you that you believe has been um, uh, responsible for your success? That somebody else who is thinking of taking that leap uh, can look at it and say, okay, here is a good reason why this makes sense. Or here, maybe I do not have exactly what it takes. 30 seconds, straight to the point. All of you. Uh, I believe in okay. Equality. okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I strongly believe in equality. So I've built a business to equal, you know, to bring equality to the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Equality. I just I just love the good life. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just love the good life and I, I want to be able to afford anything I want. So I don't want to wake up one morning and want to travel or get a get a house and I can't afford it. Yeah. So Okay, good. All right. So, you know, being wealthy, that's good motivation. Namdi. Listen, Chiki, I'm I'm gonna tell you straight up and for I'm out there, like it's, it's pretty simple. They said I couldn't do it. That's it. That's been my main motivation. I started out pre-med three and a half years going down that path, organic chemistry, calculus, all these things. Yep. And, and I, I saw, I saw a lane in marketing. I saw a lane in marketing and technology and everyone around me in my community, my parents, you guys know how that is. They said, you'll never make it because it wasn't anything they understood. That was my main motivation. And so to reach the heights that I did now and to even achieve more, instill the back of my mind, I want Nigerians, Igbo people to see that you can create a lane anywhere you desire. So my motivation is they said I couldn't do it. That's why I'm doing it. Nice. Okay, so we have equality. We have the desire to succeed and be comfortable and uh, the challenge to, um, defy all the oppositions and naysayers, right? Great. Now we are in a very um, precarious year, 2020. If anybody had told you in 2019 that we will be here, that you know, you are, you will be via Zoom. I'm sure many of us would have said that would be a lot, right? Um, so based on the things that drive you, and I know a lot of businesses, uh, some have had to shut down, some have um, suffered you know, great loss because of COVID. Now, based on the things that drive you, how have you um, um, adapted to this new reality, right? Um, how has your motivation stayed intact in making sure that even through COVID and beyond, and what seems to become a new normal, that you can still succeed, that your businesses will still try? Uh, let's start with Charles. Um, before COVID, yeah, I've, I've, I've had my hands in a lot of businesses from, from nightclubs to restaurants to, um, con um, consulting for the UN to, um, everything, you know, Nollywood. I mean, I mean, I mean, everything you get me. So COVID came and you know, crippled some of my businesses. Like I have about six nightclubs in Nigeria. Every everything is closed. I have restaurants. Everything is closed. Maybe right now the restaurants are beginning to pick up a, a, a little bit. Um, all of my businesses have you know have been affected because I mean I'm mainly in the entertainment industry. Do you get? So for me right now, um, I'm not. I see it as an opportunity. Because it is it has allowed me to look into other businesses of mine that I should, you know, shed more light on. For example, I have a BS in medical app sciences, I have an MS in health economics. I I'm right now I'm trying to open up um um a medical lab um you know for diagnosis and all. Um 
going into properly into Nollywood. My first movie was um, Living in Bondage, which was like a one-off. And now I'm doing two movies this year because initially I would have done one movie, but I have more time on my hands. I have more funds on my hands, you know, um, more funds that I want to channel towards, you know, businesses that haven't been affected by COVID. So right now, um, Netflix is selling, is buying content. Um, DSTV is buying content. So content is selling, you know. So I'm investing in things that are more important to me because right now the 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 nightlife, the hotels, the restaurants, you know, none of that is working. So um, I'm going back to the drawing board. I, I, for me, it's 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 a brand new opportunity to keep the businesses that I've developed in the, in, in the last couple of years and invest my time and the little resources I have into building newer businesses. I don't know if, if I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. I, I'll I respond. Yeah, go okay. ahead. So I'll respond to that after the other two panelists um, respond, uh, okay. because I think there was something important that you were bringing out that I would like, to, I would like for us to elaborate on. Um, Vivian. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to just kind of give a little bit of background, um, you know, I've been working on Medzaf since 2014 is when I did the first iterations of what Medzaf should be. Um, I embedded myself in the tech community, uh, in the pharma industry, in the U.S. and Nigeria and across Africa to understand how to put this company together. And I was very sure that a platform that has financing options for hospitals uses data and analytics to aggregate demand and smooth out a lot of the problems that hospitals uh, and pharmacies face in emerging markets. Uh, a platform that connects the suppliers and helps them with their operational issues that they face having to deal in chaotic uh, markets where you've got medications coming from all over the world that you have to manage. Um, the fact that in African countries, it's a black data is a black box. Um, a, there's a black box of data and you really can't extract the information that you need in order to run your business, but also expand it, uh, uh, bring new products to the market. I knew all of these things in 2014. I am an extremely focused person. So I have been streamlined and fo laser focused on MedZaf since then. Um, so the question, and then that's all I do. I have no other business. I have no other job. If Medza fails today, my, I have to start over, right? Because that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of place that you have to put yourself in to build a company that not only is good for Nigeria, but that can build solutions to leapfrog Africa and, and, and help solutions from a U.S. context from a European context. So that's the kind of level that I'm on. I've traveled around the world, looked at businesses, understood how cultures, how people actually get stuff done and build dynasties. And that's what I'm on. So when COVID-19 came, it's clearly a validation of everything I've been trying to build and building um, for the last, um, you know, I've got, since 2017 when we launched. Uh, we have over a hundred, we have over 400 hospitals and pharmacies that have interacted with us. We work typically with about 160 hospitals and pharmacies at any given time. Um, so during COVID-19, we saw hospitals that we typically may or may not have been able to get them to use our on plat online platform, go straight for the platform. Now you have people who, we've expanded to six states without having, without myself having to meet any decision maker, because we built a brand, we focused on the actual needs of the market. We know it so well, deep inside and out, that we've been able to push out any potential competitors or threats in the hospitals that we actually um, are the majority stakeholder in. So right. the point of, of COVID-19 is, and these type of opportunities that repeat 80 years, every 80 years, is you've got to have the imagination and the drive and the focus to be able to understand opportunities and take advantage of them when they come up. And you have to have the imagination and the guts and the grit 
to put yourself in situations where you can actually build something that's bigger than you, that's bigger than, than the world has ever seen. And, and that's kind of the level that I'm on. So COVID-19 is, is obviously good for MedSAF. Thank you. Awesome. Namdi. Yeah, I'm gonna tie. I'm gonna tie both responses together because uh, Vivian, especially, I, I, I love, I love what you just said. So, my answer is twofold. The first thing is, in looking at how to survive the next wave of growth, right, or to to propel my business, to keep motivated, to sort of reinvent business. It's number one. How can you do more with less? Okay, and that's true whether you're in corporate America. That's true whether you're an entrepreneur in the healthcare space, in oil and gas, construction, manufacturing, whatever, you have to find out how to do more with less. And for me, it's two things. And I said this on a, a webinar two weeks ago to about uh, 400 or so uh, uh, CFOs across the United States. Number one, do you have access to data? Which is why, Vivian, everything you're saying is spot on. You have to have access to data. Right now, whether, and in Nigeria, I'm glad you, I'm glad you made that point. If data is a black box, that literally is all you're waiting to be struck, right? We're waiting to be found in Nigeria. I know in the United States and sort of propelling business, mining data, using big data to propel business is massive right now. And that's one component of doing more with less. You have to be informed with data in order to make the sorts of strategic decisions that propel business forward with as little waste as possible. The second thing that we're doing more with less is technology right? How can you automate as much as you can, okay? So uh, my, day, in my day job, I run marketing uh, technology, right? And so these are multi-million dollar investments that inform me about who's opening emails when, who's clicking on my ads on Forbes, on, you know, New York Times, etc. And I get to sort of streamline my spend, right, and automate that so I can do the job of 20 people with one robot, you know what I mean? So as business leaders, as thought leaders here on the call, think about how you can do more with less, how you can bring in technology and data to propel business forward. So that's the first part of the answer. The second part is what my brother said. Um, uh, you know, my brother who's in Nollywood and in nightlife and entertainment, it's delivering exceptional experiences, right? And telling exceptional stories. Um, uh, like, like was mentioned in the introduction, I'm the CEO and founder of Suede Group. And what we're doing right now, our newest project is, I'm the purveyor of very, very high-end men's barbershops, the sorts that you'll find in, uh, in London or in the United Emirates, or even in, in LA and in Manhattan. I'm bringing those sorts of experiences right, uh, uh, right here to Atlanta and beyond, right, right along the East Coast. So I think about COVID and I think if someone's gonna step out of their house to go to a nightclub, to go watch a movie, right, to, to do anything, to partake in any service. How can I make sure not only are we, uh, you, uh, are we meeting all the mandates in terms of cleanliness and safety, et cetera, but how can I deliver an experience exceptionally above my competitors? Because that's gonna be the differentiator, is how can you deliver something more than the guy down the street, than the nightclub across the street, than the other barbershop uh, down the road? How can I do something even more, right? So it's that layer of exclusivity, of prestige, the icing on the cake, if you will, to your experiences that make it worthwhile for someone to step out of their house and go spend their hard earned money in an economic downturn on your business. What have you done to make your experience exceptional? And I think brand and marketing and all that play a role in how you deliver an exceptional experience. So that's twofold. One, do more with less and to deliver a remarkable, unforgettable experience. Awesome, these have been wonderful responses. I kept taking notes because uh, there's a lot that I actually wanna you know, talk about, hopefully not too long. Um, <clears throat> so here's the thing, uh, Charles talked about Nollywood and entertainment. Um, uh, Vivian talked about, in my own words, building for the future, and I'll touch on that, um, access to data, and Namdi, you just talked about doing more with less and delivering exceptional experiences, right? Now, uh, I'll relate this a little bit to a, a past experience, right? So uh, some of you know that I ran for office last year, right? And many people at the time were asking, why would you go run for office, right? You know you're not gonna win, 
blah, 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 blah. This is a waste of time, blah. But what people didn't understand and which I couldn't talk about on the campaign trail at the time was that, you know, my team and I had looked at politics in Africa. We had looked at Nigeria um, and decided, listen, the people who are in power now are people who've been in power for the last 40, 50 years. These are people who've perfected their art, the art of their deal, right? In weaponizing poverty or hunger, right? And for us, our generation, millennials and younger, who clamor and we complain about all of the bad stuff going on, there was absolutely no way we were gonna be able to topple these systems if we did not understand them, right? So going in was not, the, the priority was not to go win. It was actually to go learn that process because in learning that process, you discover where the loopholes and the flaws in their systems are. And because we're now privy to newer technologies, access to big data, um, um, our population is predominantly younger. Uh, there's internet penetration, like all of these things that work in our favor that we understand. How are we using this, right? To either circumvent their processes or to disrupt their processes. So going in to go run for office was actually a learning experience for me. So that after that process, we can develop comprehensive strategies that can now help other qualified people with um, ideologies, brilliant ideologies that understand leadership and compassion to get in there, right? Now, part of what we discovered, I'm a tech entrepreneur, and of course, running that process as well was, you know, discovering the opportunities in technology in not just Nigeria, but in Africa. Part of what we discovered was Africa is at a crossroads, and I'm going to try to be as, as, as succinct as I can be, is at a crossroads right now, right? Most of our leaders are going to die within the next decade or two, and this is the truth, right? Many of them are in their 70s and above. Only 3% of our population is over 66, so many of these horrible leaders would die, period. It's life, right? The question is, what are we doing as a generation to prepare people who can step into those positions? Because if the next people behind them get in, we've lost the continent for a good century, right? So what we discovered was there are three, three pillars right now that hold Africa, three potential opportunities. It's in entertainment, it's in technology, um, and is in politics, right? So um, Charles talked about um, Netflix investing and all that. Nollywood cranks out more movies a year than Hollywood does. And on average, it costs about 7,000 US dollars to create a Nollywood movie from start to finish. On average, it takes about 13 days. I'm sure there are you know, films that take longer and all that, which means that if you invest a little bit more if you go from seven to 20 or 25 or even 30, right? Um, you produce quality content that you can now turn around and sell to the Netflixes as original content for much more than that, right? So there's a huge opportunity in the entertainment space. One, in being able to tell our own stories. Two, in creating, you know, um, um, equity for Nollywood, right, uh, globally. Now, technology is another, is another space. Nigeria has the largest and most thriving tech ecosystem in Africa today. Last year, the largest amount of venture capital went to Nigeria. What are we doing to invest in young, brilliant, hungry entrepreneurs on the continent in Nigeria to make sure that we're beginning to own our technologies, but we are also empowering people who are building for the future? And then to Vivian's point, um, in terms of building for the future, I always tell that I tell this to a lot of black founders. I say, listen, you're not solving a problem today. Solve a problem for 20 years from now. Yes, your plan may change, but it opens your eyes to see how you become a thriving business. Because if you can think about what the future would present and you're tackling that, the likelihood that you will not only survive today, but the future is higher, right? So for all the entrepreneurs there, for all the business founders, take that, you know, 
mindset. How can I build, how can I make sure that I'm here in the next 10 years? And that requires you thinking about what you think will be, will happen in the next 10 years. Namdi talked about automation. How would that affect a population that is undereducated, underskilled, underprepared for the fourth industrial revolution, right? So when you start to ask yourself these questions, you start to solve problems, real problems for the future. That's how you start to build tribal businesses. All right. So I'm not trying to, you know, overtake the entire thing. My next question now is, you all are, you know, brilliant founders. You all know how and have leveraged technology and innovation. What do you think, or how do you think technology and innovation um, plays a role in, in building thriving businesses in a place like Nigeria, where you don't have power, you don't have infrastructure? Um, I usually feel conflicted when I talk about corruption, but yes, there is corruption in you know, uh, government and all that. How do you use technology and innovation to build thriving businesses? Anyone can go first. Can I, can I answer that? that that's, uh, so that was actually the thesis of what I needed to figure out when I got to Lagos, right? Um, you have this infrastructure in place, and in my specific industry, there is actually a cabal right? Um, there are cabals that, that run the pharmaceutical, you know, the trade of medications. Everything um, in Nigeria. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, there's also Everything a cabal. In Nigeria. Um, yeah. So, you know, that was actually the thesis that I wanted to answer is, you know, how can I use um, technology to jump over these hurdles and create a business that becomes so big that I can actually then neutralize these threats. Um, I have ne I'm so proud I have never paid a bribe. Um, we've, we obviously, we have to have licenses for our, our company, never paid a bribe. You know, I've, I've um, been arrested in the open drug market, but those guys like me now because I'm actually providing a service to them. And, and so the point is, is like, you've got to figure out how to actually look at the pain points of all of these various players in your supply chain, right? And right. when you look at your, the pain points, then you have to figure out, you have to, first of all, you have to empathize with them. And then you can figure out how can I create a mutually beneficial service or situation where every single player in the supply chain is incentivized to actually work with me in the way that I want to work with them. And then how can I build my platform and make it so powerful in their minds that I can start to influence their behavior and move everybody in the direction that I want them to move using technology. And so that's what we've been working on at, at Medzaf. Um, the other important thing I wanna make sure to point out is, and this is something, I would say that one of the most annoying things about working in Nigeria is this concept that I think I made up, I can't quite remember, of um, ambition with no foundation. Everybody wants to be the boss, everybody wants to do everything without actually having built the foundation. Um, before you can build a tech company that can actually scale across a Nigerian context or Africa or even the world, you need to work on building a strong foundation first. That means every single piece of your business, you've got to kick the tires, test it, make sure you've analyzed it, that you've done the hard work, the, the things that are not sexy, right? I am in operations all day and I'm not an operations person, right? But those are the, the sacrifices. I'm in finance all day, operations all day, logistics, you know, um, you know these are the, 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 the pieces of my business that I have to make sure are extremely strong um, so that as we continue to grow and as we build, you, you know, we start to move into the, 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 you know, fully realized tech solution that we will then start uh, introducing into other countries next year, that these fundamental pieces of the business do not fail. Um, and so that it's, it's that, you know, foundation and then also just using wild creativity. Everybody told me that what I'm doing today is absolutely impossible. Every single person. Um, and the, the reality is, is I don't care what you think. I know this thing and I know that it's gonna work and it has, 
right? So you have to have, to have an unshakable belief in yourself and you have to, to understand how your technology can facilitate what's already working well on the ground. Trust me, Nigerians are very smart people. They've already figured out how to manage and go around and under all of the issues that they have to deal with on a daily basis. So how do you extract what works really well for the people on the ground, build technology solutions around it to facilitate it, and then you can then start to eradicate the bad pieces of, of what happens in Nigeria, right? Nice. So these are just some, I've got a lot more, you know, maybe I'll make a, have a book too one day, you know, I'll talk about it, but I'll, I'll let the other panelists go. I, I want to jump in. I want to awesome. jump in. Before you guys jump in, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, those who are listening, if you have any questions, start to prepare them. I would love to engage you guys in this conversation. Um, but yeah, to Vivian's point, Everybody in Nigeria wants a title, right? You know, when I was running for office, it was so funny that um, you would find young people who would tell you they're CEO of this, president of this, ambassador to this. I'm like, yo, how are you doing all of this stuff? But yes, <laughs> ambition without foundation is dangerous. Um, so yeah, yeah. Namdi, Namdi, yeah go ahead. I, I, I want to jump in. Chike, this is something you mentioned before. And, and Vivian, um, by the way, so this is the first time Vivian and I have ever met. So this is real time. You are an inspiration. Right. So we need to we need to connect. We need to connect after this. I, I want to say this because Chike, you mentioned sort of how do we how do we ensure right that as and this is demographics, it's just life. As as the old generation sort of fades out, how do we make sure we prop ourselves up so that we're taking advantage of those open seats, right? Uh, in political office, that we're starting businesses, thriving businesses, etc. I want to say something, and this is sort of hits the nail on the head, but also uh, a bit off the beaten path. And that's be, let's, as Igbo people, right? Let's be unapologetic about putting our brothers and sisters in positions. Right. Okay. That goes to all of us who are on the call as leaders. Mm -hmm. And that goes to everyone who is listening now who are both leaders and folks who are, 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 are pushing to move themselves forward. Let me tell you something. This is one criticism that I have of us, and it's a call to action for us to do better, right? Mm -hmm. We don't do that enough. We don't look back and say, how do I make sure my brother, listen, as, as the youngest, only black, right, C-level executive at a public company, I'm looking through and I have internship slots in my company. I'm looking through, I had two slots to give away, and one went to a really brilliant person. And so we kept going. She happened to be a white female. We keep flow. I, I must have gone through weeks of resumes. And they said, Namdi, you're passing through all these qualified people. I said, let me tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an Igbo name, period. Mm -hmm. And I didn't care who heard it. I said, so nepotism is okay there, but not okay here. No, I need right. to find, and lo and behold, I found one guy, Uzoma. I said, hire him right now. The guy now is a manager making 90 plus thousand dollars a year because I was unapologetic about making sure Umunam, somebody who I know I can maybe trace, you know, uh, my family back to his family somehow in Omaha or somewhere, Obo, whatever. I knew that the opportunity that I created for him would, would, would send ripples, waves throughout our entire community. That's the call to action. I think in setting ourselves up, Chike, you said it best, right? Whether it's politics, whether it's entertainment, et cetera, we don't do a good enough job when right. we reach certain heights in our, in our careers and in business to say, how do I intentionally create a lane for someone who looks like me, sounds like me, has my right. same last name. I know yep. their village, they know mine. How do I pull them along? I think that's really important. It's a call to action for all of us. Um, Charles, I'll let you go because I can literally just take over this stuff. <laughs> um, as regards, you know, carrying our Igbo um, family along, our brothers and sisters, um, that's something similar to what I'm doing with um, Nollywood. I'm, you know, I've, I've bought like almost four um, IPs now. I bought Living in Bondage, I bought Rattlesnake, I bought Neka the Pretty Serpent, I bought Glamour Girls. These are all, you know, um, Igbo IPs, you right. get me? And if, if you guys watched Living in Bondage, I made sure that we integrated the whole Igbo speaking thing, you know, inside the whole um, a movie. I would not, for me, I think, it's, 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 I think I'm just trying to 
you know, follow up on what Nam Nambi said, not your question. But yeah, I think we have to carry along our fellow Igbo people. Do you get me? But as regards your question, Vivian and Nambi have already said it all. So yeah. Awesome. Um, so there, there have been too many names popping up at the same time. Um, is there, is there one of the admins who is sort of like holding questions and uh, just want to throw them out to the panelists? Okay, there's Obin Nokani. That's the one that shows up right now. How do you plan on creating sustainable something and it just disappear? Um, but yeah, you know, just to sort of pull together everything you guys have said, I, I think is extremely important. Uh, there's something else that I like to talk about um, with our people, especially, um, and that's preserving our language. Um, in my experience, I don't know if this is for everyone, but in my experience, I tend to feel like a lot of our people don't like to speak Igbo outside, right? Um, well, my parents are Nigerians, I'm American. Tell them I said that, right? You know, um, how do we pass on heritage? How do we pass on culture um, to our children and their children and their children if we do not uh, appreciate and embrace who we are as a people? And this is just tying back to what Namdi said, right? Um, it's important. The language is extremely and extremely and extremely important. You know, I'm from Nigeria, I'm more French, more Chinese, more Mandarin, well, same thing, more everything, right? Except for Igbo, and it kills me. Sorry, guys, I'm frustrated when I talk about it. It kills me. Where are the questions? Please, um, can, can I speak to that from a business perspective? Okay, please, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, maybe it's going to say something that's a little bit unpopular here. Um, but I have traveled around the world and I have embedded myself in cultures on purpose to understand how their people are successful, how, did it, how, how many different ethnic groups are there, how do people work together, and how does that impact business? The reality is, is that there is not going to be a strong Nigeria or Nigeria wealth, or Nigeria companies that expand worldwide until there is a unified Nigeria, right? right. And that's just the reality of it. So I feel like from, a, from living in Nigeria for the last six, seven years, there needs to be your culture and then there needs to be unif unification of a country. Think about a country like India where they have a caste system, but if you go to, uh, the United States, they've got their culture at home, and then in the streets, they're Indian and they're united, right? So from, I don't know if, if that is, if there are ways to kind of integrate culture into business, but I will say that the detriment of business, of operating as an Igbo businesswoman in Lagos, is that culture is so much more, oh, you're Yoruba, you're Igbo, you're this, you're that, and the division has been has definitely caused problems unnecessary problems for my business so i i don't know i know this is a business you know panel i you know from my perspective that's just it so that might be something to talk about in another panel somewhere else but the reality is is there's got to be some way to unify bring your resources together and somehow pool and bring yourself out of poverty because let me tell you something nigeria is in a bad state right now uh, for everybody that's just in the u.s nigeria is in a pretty bad state it's it's worse than i've ever seen it and i've seen it through elections i've seen it when all of the people who came with me left back to the united states all the different waves of returnees if i'm gone from lagos that means things are bad so just throwing that out there um, let me add something to that before I try out a question that was actually directed at you. Um, so I love diversity and inclusion, don't get me wrong, but I believe that you have more leverage, you have a stronger seat at the table if you have power from exclusivity. So I understand your point about unification in Nigeria, but if you do not know who you are and where you're coming from, you cannot negotiate the right way, right? When you have the power of a community behind you, um, it becomes, in my opinion, easier to build that unification 
because you have people who are powerful coming together to become one. But if we're disconnected and not there connected, more, right? There should be no more, oh, I'm Emo State, I'm a Nambra. We are Evo people. Get it together, bring your resource Thank together. You. Yes. Like a power block in Lagos where the money is and start like making the country start looking at you as somebody who has something. That's what right. I was asking. Somebody said period. Um, so somebody asked, <laughs> somebody <laughs> asked, um, what has it been like as a woman setting up a business in Nigeria um, and maintaining your value system? Absolutely. This is a, I will write a book on this because again, like I walked into Lagos saying, I walked into Nigeria saying all these challenges, which includes the cultural mindset of our people, which is a challenge and a threat to me as a woman running business, whether it's, I'm, am I, I'm a woman, so should I actually even be taken seriously? Am I smart? Can I actually execute on what I'm asked to do? Whether it's that, or even to the other piece of it, which is, oh, go get married and have kids, just go sit down, stop talking, um, which I've heard all my life anyway, so. I was uh, used to it, um, but you know, and or even the worst pieces of 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 you know the cultural aspect, which is how you treat women in a sexual way, right? Or how you sexualize women or treat women, you know? How does money, um, uh, poverty interplay with reactions or with interactions with women on a daily basis in an African context? These are all things that I absolutely had researched. I had seen, um, I had, by the time I got to Nigeria, I was a seasoned traveler. I had been in Brazil, I'd been in China, I had been all over Europe, I'd seen many different, I'd been all over South America, seen Asia, you know, I had seen these kind of, you know, dynamics and the way that they interplayed. And so I had figured out how to devise plans to go with the tide, but then also create my own my own lane. Um, I'll give a tip. One of the things I did do um, or allow to be done is I did allow, you know, my, my actual real uncle uh, to introduce me to all of his uh, business contacts as his daughter, right? Because I knew that I needed to start to kind of take, I knew that I needed a man, right? Like I needed the male, I needed a man to help me start to get the validity that I needed to be able to navigate the uh, the or uh, the country the way that I wanted to navigate, right? That that's just that's just something that I knew was a reality, right? Um, so you know, it's just more of understanding the dynamics and then making myself slowly powerful enough to be able to to operate in the way that I want to operate on my own terms. Awesome. So my own value systems have always been intact, and I think. The reality is, is that you don't know who you are or your value systems unless you test them. And I, I, I had actually been doing those things for fun for years by solo traveling, which all, all the Nigerian uh, parents will, you know, you know, maybe shake um, if I actually go into that into detail, but I've already been doing those things. So when I got to Nigeria, I was powerful enough to take it on. And I would say that a lot of creativity, thinking outside of the box, and not seeing um, challenges as deterrence, but as ways motivation. just kind of motivation um, and kind of something that Nandis had said earlier, you know, I, I kept getting discounted, whether that's because I'm a girl, but maybe that's because I didn't go to the best schools, maybe because I'm not a doctor or this or that. And I said, well, let me show you. Now my company, we're, we're raising money. We're about to scale to other countries. We will be, um, in the in the west so you will see us um you will see medzaf powering pharmaceutical platforms around the world eventually um awesome. and i just keep going right so um being a woman is not a deterrent but you need to do your research to figure out your own game plan of how to navigate cool uh charles this question is for you it says medical labs exist in nigeria all those sophisticated ones are few what model do you have in mind going into this new business line? Okay. Um, for me, I'm just trying to sell affordable luxury. So if I'm able to create a medical lab that, that almost 
mimics a hotel. So you come in, there's a reception, there's ambience music. Um, you don't smell um, like you're, it doesn't smell like you're in the hospital. You know, um, there's, there's the, the people attending to you are clean. It's, it's, you can, you can, you know, um, go far away from the original medical lab plan. But as long as, for me, my own plan is just to make it as, as comfortable as possible you get. And then into, introduce certain things like drip cocktails, things that would also help you boost your immune system. So it's not just, it's not just about coming into the lab to run the test because you're not feeling fine. You should be able to come into the lab. So I, I want to call it like, I, I want to call it um, a health lounge. So you can come into the lab and get like um, a drip cocktail or get like um, a fresh, fresh juice or get like um, um, a skin glow treatment, you know, or just basically make it an experience, you know, unlike the regular labs here, when you come in, they just take your blood sample, tell you to come back tomorrow. So what I want to do is when you come, take a blood sample, they send the results to you. You don't need to come back. Um, try and digitalize it as, 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 as much as I can. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that was my BSc. I've not done so much. Um, I haven't experienced so much in that field in the last, you know, uh, the last time I was in the lab was about 10, 10, 10 years ago. So going back into that industry right now, I'm just trying to bring the, the um, entertainment bits and the health bits and create one massive experience. It's in my head. It's in my head. That's no business plan. It just, I feel it can work. I'm just about to try it out. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Namdi, uh, with uh, Suede Group, right? Um, do you have any plans of um, scaling that into Nigeria? If you do, when if, and where? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, for those of you guys who uh, may have missed this part, so I'm the, uh, I'm the founder and, uh, and principal at Suede Group. And right now my biggest projects, uh, you know, are, are creating the high end, uh, you know, barbershop wellness experience. In fact, drip cocktails, uh, you know, like Charles mentioned, is, is on the menu for some of the services we're thinking about offering, including medical hair restoration, uh, just robotic hair treatments, et cetera. So, but really high end membership only, et cetera. It's interesting because I've shared this business plan with, with many friends um, and some, uh, some business people in Nigeria who have disposable income. And I've actually turned down investors uh, uh, because I just feel like it's too soon uh, to, to scale into Lagos. Uh, my plan is to first really become dominant in three East Coast and even Midwest cities. So my eyes are on Atlanta, obviously. Uh, my eyes are on New York. My eyes are on DC and Chicago. Uh, and if I can get, if I can get two to three of those cities and really master those cities, uh, then I'm looking to scale, obviously, to, uh, to go home. But um, home is always calling me, man. I mean, you, you know, I feel like my calling in life won't be complete until I've scaled my business ambitions and my personal ambitions uh, to to create wealth and jobs and opportunities uh, for folks in Nigeria. So, so the short answer is yes. I, I do plan on scaling. Uh, to uh, to Nigeria sometime in the future. Awesome. Uh, for those of you who are doing work in Nigeria, how do you go about finding partners who can help given the hesitation regarding people doing 419? So pretty much how do you, um, you know, scale the hurdle of um, corrupt partners or scammers in Nigeria for those who plan to do business in Nigeria? Anyone can take that. Um, I, I can take that. So um, I have raised um, to date about 1.4 million um, and we're about to do a pre-seed for about 3.5 million. And I would say the majority of our investors are actually in the U.S., um, Silicon Valley. Um, and we have VC investors as well. Um, we're represented across the U.S., Europe, um, and Africa. Um, and so this was always on my mind because here I am in an industry that's mostly illegal, actually. Um, and I've got to figure out how to bring this illegal industry into the light and make it legal, transparent, 
and a win-win for every, you can definitely invest in MedSafe. Let's talk about that um, in just a second. Sorry. Uh, I love the comments. Um, you know, here, here I am having to bring this illegal industry into the light. Um, and so what I found that worked really well is to really just speak out. And, and so there's this thing that I don't know is so weird to me, like stealth mode. I've never heard of stealth mode. I don't even know what stealth mode is because as a black woman trying to raise VC money, I can't be quiet about MedZap. Every single person has to know about MedZap that's relevant. They have to know about MedZap. They have to hear my voice and they have to empathize with me so that they can potentially be partners, employees, or investors, right? So I think that getting rid of this idea that you're gonna secretly do this on the down low, et cetera, you know, if you bring it to the light on your LinkedIn, which is like my go-to, you know, or just by speaking to people about your, what you're trying to work on and really doing the work, like my financial model, all of my documentations, I've done audits, um, even though we're still kind of young, like I, I, everything I, you know, legally, you know, everything is, is, is in line, right? From a finance perspective, from a legal perspective, from a framework perspective, everything is in line, right? We just need money to achieve our KPIs. So you just really got to come, you've got to outdo everybody else. You've got to be better, obviously, because you've got that Nigerian discount or the African discount, but you can absolutely do it. And that's just by being loud, but making sure you have everything in place to back up what you say. Awesome. Um, here's another question. Uh, Namde, I'll let you start and then maybe Vivian concludes. Uh, it says, my question is geared towards creating a platform that drives data, data usage in Nigeria. How can we mine data or analyze data from Nigeria when data is not consistent? collected correctly or accurately and integrated into the daily lives of all Nigerians, not just urban Nigeria. Yeah, so, so yeah, the, the question is clear. Um, Vivian, I'll let you take that just because truthfully, I don't have the, the context uh, necessary. I will, I will say this though, um, I, think, I think that some of that, some of that data prevalence is beginning to happen and uh, please you know charles vivian i i, I uh cor correct me where i go wrong but some of that data is becoming prevalent especially when it comes to uh mobile payments and just payment systems in general just the financial uh system in nigeria as cash is still king obviously uh but as we become more and more of a cashless system with mobile payments etc i think those data points though they may be scarce it is enough to begin to build on, right? So the more we do a better job at building demographic data and firmographic data on top of those financial data points that we're collecting, I think now what you have is a web, right? A web that we can begin to create to build sort of that data discipline, you know? So uh, you're right, data may be scarce, et cetera, but I know at least from a data standpoint where, where I sit, right, in US companies, doing business globally, it's usually financial systems that lead the way. And then we, we augment that data with all of the different intricacies around demographics, right? Uh, for instance, name, age, you know, career, income, et cetera, or with businesses, firmographics. And now you begin to build a web, right, of, of data that you can, uh, you, you can uh, manipulate, not manipulate in a negative way, but use and leverage uh, to grow business. So that's that's sort of general advice as far as on the ground in Nigeria. That's that's what I think. Vivian, Charles, I, you know, I'll let you guys speak directly to it. Um, so what I would say is that um, data is is nothing without a database, right? And you can't have a database unless you have systems in place to actually collect and aggregate data in a streamlined way that is useful for not only your own system, but that can also be transferred to other systems and, and, and translated, right? Mm -hmm. So from a tech entrepreneur perspective, of course we made the mistake of thinking that the very first thing that we needed to do was to throw up 
an e-commerce platform and get people purchasing medications um, online. That was actually not the first thing to do. The very first thing to do was to actually create this very powerful database that we have now that powers everything that we do. Um, like for example, this, this uh, year we have identified over 89 million data points that we will use to monetize um, as it pertains to price fluctuations, you know, availability, brand preference, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we couldn't get here without, again, building the framework, understanding that it's a database issue. It's not about data. It's a database issue. Um, and that's an, and a da that database issue can actually solve issues across the country. It, it, a lot of the issues in the, in the entire country of Nigeria are about lack of streamlined information. So um, as far as data, that's what that is. But then also you can't really get the data because you can't necessarily facilitate the business unless you have a platform play. And I really feel that platform plays are the future of Africa. They're the way that technology is going to be able to scale outside of a localized perspective to a, cro a continent perspective. And that means you've got all the resources or you've got all the partnerships in place for a person to do business with the least amount of friction as possible. So on MedZaf's platform or MedZaf's ecosystem, you know, we've got uh, financing. We've been financing hospitals since 2017. We've been providing logistics services through partnerships as well as in-house logistics since 2017. We have an in-house, our entire in-house team of quality control pharmacists that are at, you know, that are, are giving, ser providing services uh, to our hospitals and pharmacies that is built into what we do. You know, we have Again, our, our platform that's facilitating, you know, supplier medications to hospitals and pharmacies. And, you know, we've got this network of manufacturers that we work with. But if we didn't have those pieces in place, um, we wouldn't be as successful as we have been today. Um, and once we actually are able to close this round and build the platform to a commercialized level, then we, you know, now we don't even need to hold stock. We don't have to have a physical location in Nigeria. We're just moving um, across the continent, um, extracting information, right, right, to help facilitate the movement of medications for right. all stakeholders. So it's really, because remember, data doesn't mean anything unless you have data points. And right. you can't get a data point from you know, you can't get a data point from a small sample size. You've got to have, have a massive sample size. So again, and, and how do you get a massive sample size? You've got to have something that can move quickly and that has a good ease of use. So there's lots of steps that are involved. Um, I don't necessarily think there's any one company right now that's doing it perfectly. Um, I think there's a lot of room to grow and it, it, it can be adapted to any industry. Right. I think, I actually think that there is you know, data in Nigeria, we just don't have the right platforms uh, to use them or to access them, right? So even running for office, it was easy to get, you know, a list of all of the people who had registered to vote. You just had to pay for it, right? You had several agents who can get them from wherever they needed to get them from, and you can now choose to do whatever you want to do with them, WhatsApp or blah, 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 blah. So I think there is, even in the financial you know, um, services industry, which I think right now may actually be the most advanced in terms of collecting um, and using data in Nigeria. Um, I, I think we do have data, we just don't have the right platforms to use them right. All right, so we are running out of time. I'm gonna try to run through a few questions um, before we take closing thoughts. Um, so Namdi, there's a question for you, says, uh, could you talk more about your production company? Um, and then in addition to that, I'm going to ask one question of all of you and then come back to one last question here. Um, in terms of raising capital, many times young entrepreneurs, uh, especially in the tech industry, people think, oh, I have an idea. I'm just going to go out and raise venture capital. And then when they get all the no's, People, you know, get flustered and say, you know, it was racism or they didn't like me. No, um, there are steps that need to be taken. You have to have, you know, whatever it is you need to have uh, to, to raise capital, venture capital. Um, but in terms of your businesses, 
things, right? Um, Charles, you've run, you've been a serial entrepreneur. Um, could you walk us through your process of raising capital for your business and how you sustained them prior to COVID? Um, and the same question goes for everyone, but Namdi, I kind of want you to start, you know, with, you know, talking about your production company and, you know, how people can um, find information about that. And sure. then we go next, yeah. Sure, uh, I, I'll make it quick. So thank you for that question, by the way. Um, uh, the name of my production company, film company is Madison and Greenwich, right? Nibo, I know you're curious. What kind of name is Madison and Greenwich? It's not, doesn't sound Nibo, doesn't sound Nibo. Uh, anyway, so uh, Madison and Greenwich is a combination of uh, two names. So my partner and I, me and Namdi Woke, him, Desmond Osea Champong, which is a Ghanaian uh, guy, one of my best friends. We grew up together. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we've been uh, best friends since childhood. I grew up on Madison Street. He was born in Greenwich uh, in London. And that's where the name Madison and Greenwich came from. Here's the thing. Um, you know, uh, Madison Avenue, where, you know, most ad revenue comes from, it's like so much like the, the, it's the Wall Street of the, the advertising space. We wanted a name, just like Vivian, you, Vivian, you made a good point about understanding the environment in which you are operating, right, and using that and a male, right, as leverage to then sort of show up and dominate as a powerful Nigerian woman. In the same way, we knew that two African guys trying to break into the advertising space, we needed some leverage. It's almost like Jamie Foxx, who when he put that name down on paper, no one knew if it was a man or a woman. When people see Madison and Greenwich, they don't know who we are. And then we see their work. I sent out the, the URL for you guys to see, but most folks who look at this body of work won't know that it's a Nigerian guy and a Ghanaian guy who are behind this company. PlayStation, Gatorade, Samsung, Xfinity, Tostitos, on and on, BMW, Hillshire Farms, uh, Outback Steakhouse. Like I said, we're doing work right now with Apple and some new campaigns with them. We've done stuff with Martell, et cetera, Pampers. No one knows we're behind this. Now, here's the deal. Charles made a really good point. There's also, we've been getting, because we have connections at Netflix and all these major uh, production studios in Hollywood, and we're getting calls personally to my personal cell phone to my partner's personal cell phone, saying that now your stories, Africans, Nigerians, African-Americans, your stories are what we're craving now. So Netflix and the world is open. And guess what? Nigerians, Africans, we are open for business. If you're in the right position, if you've invested your own capital in your own dream, most of the projects that you see here are the result of my business partner and I since we were in our 20s, investing our own money, our own capital into uh, building our own portfolio to create the sorts of commercials that most of you guys who have flipped through MTV and BET, et cetera, the Tostitos commercials on there, Outback Steakhouse, I shot them. I was right there on set. I was on set shooting commercials for Samsung that you guys have seen as you scroll through advertising on Facebook or on your television, Doritos commercials, et cetera, that have shown up or, or have inspired Super Bowl commercials, it was two African boys behind the camera, like the executive producers running the studio. So we take a lot of pride in what we've done. We're getting into animated series now uh, that we're producing with Netflix eye on it. Uh, we have a, a movie that we, uh, that we produced that just won um, you know, uh, an award, an uh, independent film award out there in, in Canada. And we're producing other things for television, right? So, like I said, I'm the investor. I don't work the day to day, but I'm investor and, and, and advisor to that business. And um, uh, it's been a great ride so far. But like I said before, two African boys running this thing. T to tie back to the question you asked before, uh, Chike, I, I, think, I think from the onset, and I have very, a, a varied experience in this. With Madison and Greenwich, we invested our own capital. Before any of these studios started to believe in the kind of content we could produce, we did it ourselves. Secondly, I have been a, t a tech entrepreneur in, in the startup world here in the United States where I've raised, uh, uh, I've raised money to multi-million dollar valuation for startups that I've run. Here's the thing, even if you're out there raising money, you're raising funds from VCs, et cetera, folks who may not look like you, sound like you, et cetera, you need to have an uncompromising belief in yourself right. before you take any money. I walked away from their investment 
because I was being asked to do things that my white counterparts, right, my white partners weren't being asked to do, right? And I saw it as an unfair advantage and almost like a stereo, you know, uh, uh, here, here's this brilliant guy, he's Nigerian, he's Igbo, but we need you to do this. And no, we're not gonna ask your other co-founders to do it. And I told them all to go to hell. Mm-hmm. I'm not taking your money. This is after raising a $3 million pre-money valuation. I, de- I declined the money and I went forward with that business anyway. To, uh, got, got some clients, became successful, and ultimately exited those co-founders and closed the business because I had an uncompromising belief in myself first. So I think in raising money and all of that, you have to understand that there's an exchange that happens when you take money. And sometimes it goes beyond payment terms or raising a series A, B, C, D. It's about your belief in yourself. How much do you believe that you can create value in the market, whether it's with that product or with something else? Which is why, Vivian, your story resonates with me all the other entrepreneurs and founders, even everyone in the chat, everyone's doing amazing things, but raising money is a very sensitive thing. And I beg you all to have first an uncompromising belief in yourself. Awesome. Um, Charles. Charles kind of usually abandons us for a while. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so guys, eh, I I wanted to comment on, um, on the last question about data. Um, mm-hmm. in Nigeria. Okay. Um, from my experience, I think I'm, I feel like I'm the, one of the few people who don't, um, I don't hold on to data so much. I don't believe, I believe if you have an idea, like what Namdi was saying, if you believe in, um, in, in something, you go for it, regardless of the data that is existing. Nigeria, Nigeria's database is either, you know, it's either, it's, um, overestimated or is underestimated. So it's not something you want to rely on. You know, I've been in business for 13 years now and I do it the other way around. So I, I start up the business first and then I look for the data. Do you get me? Because um, I figured out that most times when I want to go into business and I pick up the data and I figure out, you know, the business plan and all of that, I see myself being discouraged at times. So I believe in something. I don't want to think about how it fits into the Nigerian system. If I, see, if I can think about it, it means I can actually bring it to life. So I just jump into it and then figure out later. It, it's benefited me. It cost me as well. But um, yeah, that's for data. And then for raising money, it's still linked to um, data. Um, people would want to ask you, okay, I believe in this business. I want to open up um, a restaurant. They want to see business plan. They want to see um, estimates. And that is where data still comes in. And for me, if you believe in your idea, you need to find a way to um, raise the money yourself. Um, from my own experience, that's why if you check my account today, I'm always on almost on zero dollar. Because as I make money, I invest my money. I say, so if I have 10 businesses, nine of, of, my, of my 10 are constantly investing in 10 new more businesses. So the only time I would, I would think of looking for money outside my own resources is if, for example, I, I jump or I stumble across an op- opportunity that I don't want to miss, and then I might decide to look for investors. But um, I think the most important thing is believing in yourself because somehow when you believe in something, the, the, the universe has a way of putting things in place. I think once you believe you can do it, the money would come because that belief, that belief in itself is capital. Do you understand? That's what a lot of people don't understand. That belief in itself is capital. So, and that's like 50% of your project. So once you believe in something like, like the living in bondage story, um, I was never in Hollywood. I was watching CNN someday, and then CNN is talking about how um, Living in Bondage brought about Hollywood and how it was an amazing story. And I said to myself, my wife was like, you said you wanted to go into Hollywood. Why don't you do a remake of Living in Bondage? I'm like, okay. I called Ramzinora that night. What about 8 p.m.? I'm like, who has the right to this movie? He said some guy, um, Kenneth Mibwe, we called Kenneth the next morning, and Kenneth said he's, he's no more in acting. He's left that industry. He's now a pastor. 
his presently in his in his village in Oweri. We got to Oweri that same day. We sat down with Kenneth. I'm like, Kenneth, I want to buy this right. Give it to me. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I believed in remaking a classic. Nobody thought about it. Nobody thought it would work. And boom, somehow I believed in it. And then the funding somehow came into the pool. I don't know if I'm making sense, guys. But yeah, believe in yourself. Um, funding will always come. Funding will always come. I, be, I, I think your belief in itself is, is your capital. Yeah. So um, Nigeria, as much as Nigeria is so disorganized, is actually very organized as well. Because um, I don't know, in, in the US, you would hardly find a random guy who would give you $100,000 to invest in any project without a business plan and history. Nigeria, you would find some random person who just listens to you and, you know. So to all of you Igbo guys out there, I think- Charles, um, where are these people, please? We need to connect. They are there, <laughs> I swear. Let me, let me tell you something here. Eh? See this thing COVID taught me, eh? COVID in the last six months, you know, it, it has created new billionaires worldwide, even in Nigeria. Mm. So my, I've divided my hustle into five. I have the Nollywood hustle, I have the healthcare hustle, I have the nightlife hustle, I have the, you know, um, another coded business hustle. And then the <laughs> last hustle is to look for people who have money to invest. And these people, they, they are working on the streets. You know, let me tell you, our fellow Igbo people, in, in, in Abuja, there are houses that are, that are stuffed with money. That there are politicians who have stolen money and don't know what to do with it. That's the issue we are facing in Nigeria. There are people no. who have listen. You guys this listen to me a, clearly. This is a private conversation between us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll tell you. But guys, listen to me. There are people who have money, right, and are looking for people who have legit businesses. They want to invest. The problem okay. with our politicians is that they take money from the government and they keep it in the houses. Uh, they can't invest the money. They take okay. money from the from the government. They can't put. They can't even put it in the bank because they will feed their account. So they want to invest it. So you need to come up with your ideas and just push it out. Somebody will call you. Can I, can I, this will have, can I say something okay. towards that? Wait, we are running out of time. That so I say okay. one, one thing: if you're trying to build a business that will be outside of Nigeria and potentially into Europe or the United States, you do have to be very careful that you're not raising any politically exposed funds. Otherwise, uh, that will prevent you from being able to scale your business. So just remember, everybody has different types of businesses and some you need VC and you need institutional money and some you don't. It's not a bad thing. It's just two different sides. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you, but you need to understand that the, the beauty about Nigeria is that there are people who will give you cash and just believe in you. You there, there's there's no there's no you know there's there's no paperwork linked to your business. They just they just want to invest. They we want ten percent of your business. They don't anyway. We will discuss it later. I know it's two different sides, yeah. two different companies. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there are different ways to get around that. You know, you can set up a legal entity that they that does the investment for them, but that's a whole bunch of other things. Um, so we exactly. are out of time. Um, there was one particular question I really wanted to ask um, before closing thoughts, but I'm gonna you know, bunch them together. Um, so there is this um, perception that for you to succeed as a business or even as a startup in Nigeria, you must be in Lagos, right? Um, and this, I had a conversation with a friend when Lagos State banned Gokada and all of them, God rest his soul, um, Fahim, so um, banned them from working in, you know, Lagos and people were up in arms. I'm like, listen, Lagos, the population of Lagos is only 10% of Nigeria's population. There's so many other cities that you can go into. For instance, in the Southeast, yes, there are five states, but the difference, you know, between some of the major cities in the Southeast it's not that much of you know, a hassle that you cannot start and scale businesses there. So the question is, 
how do we start to open up hubs, business hubs, especially in the Southeast, but also across the country? That's one. And then two, give us your final thoughts. Like, what are you working on? Um, what advice do you have for people? And you have 30 seconds to do all that. I will literally cut you up if you go beyond that. So this is the test of time. We want to go first. <laughs> I take a minute. Um, can I go first? The ladies first. Okay. Uh, um, okay, so quick one. You cannot scale into the East without money. So if you care about um, in entrepreneurs being able to start up their company in the East, you need to aggregate your money together as an organization, create an entity where you can invest in entrepreneurs and start subsidizing their, their investments or start subsidizing them so that they can start in the East. Otherwise, you're going to continue to get Legos-based companies that incorporate in the United States and then move to the Europe to live, okay? So that's what I'll just say there. Um, we are currently raising 3.5 uh, million pre-series. Um, we're over 75% committed. Um, we're scaling across Africa. So we're going into Kenya and Ivory Coast next with some of our partners like AXA and uh, Sanofi, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are looking to join a movement that quality medication is a fundamental human right, find me on LinkedIn. Um, so if you're looking to learn more about it's, 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 it's important to tell us, it's important to tell us 3.5, that cannot be Naira, right? Because no, I can just give you that right now. $3.5 million. Dollars. So I okay. raised USD. Okay, cool. Awesome. 3.5 US dollars. 3.5 million US dollars. Okay, awesome. Um, who's next? 30 oh, seconds. Okay. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, guys. I'm not advising anyone to launder money. Don't get me wrong. It is, it, it is, it is a crime to launder money. But what I'm saying in, in Nigeria, Nigeria is a totally different ball game. If you want to do business in Nigeria, you need to understand that not everyone who is a politician is a thief. Not everyone who has money is a thief. And Nigerians are so impatient. A lot of them just believe in your idea, not your data. So, for, so in Nigeria, in doing business, what you need to do is believe in yourself and the, the, the people that would invest in your business are working on the street. All you need to do is get ready to sell your idea to them. I don't know if that makes sense, but awesome. not so, to collect money that is illegal. Please tell, don't get me wrong, tell guys. Tell us what are you doing these days? Where can people find you? How can they follow you? All of that. Okay, I'm on Instagram, Charles of Play. Twitter as well, Charles of Play. LinkedIn is Charles of Play. Awesome. Um, okay, Namdi, your turn. Yeah. Before they kick us. yeah, final thoughts. Thank you so much for having me. So I'll say this. In terms of what, what is actionable for everyone who joined today, and by the way, guys, everyone who joined, the chat is popping. Thank you so much. Um, I'll say this. I'm on a mission to help create the next generation of business leaders, right? here in the US. And when I say business leaders, I mean Nigerians who occupy vice president and C-level positions and even senior director positions at global Fortune 500 companies, okay? A lot of you guys are already doing this already, but if that is you, if this call appeals to you, I, I, I ask you, reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn, Namdi Woke. Same thing on Twitter, same thing on Facebook. On, on Instagram, I'm the Namdi experience. So if you are interested in growing your career and you wanna be connected with someone who's been there, done that, right? And I'm very interested and motivated in finding people who want to come along in this path that creates generational wealth for your families, then reach out to me. From a business standpoint, uh, uh, I'm doing some really cool things with Madison and Greenwich, like I said. Uh, so if you're interested in film and production and you want, you're an, uh, an eye into that world at the very highest levels, then please do reach out to me as well. Again, you can reach me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, uh, uh, anywhere. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much to the panelists. There's so many questions coming up. Unfortunately, we couldn't get through to all of them. Uh, this has been exciting. Hopefully at uh, some other point, we'll have another session on building wealth and how to find all those money walkers in, in, uh, in, in Abuja. Charles, I'm coming for you. 
Um, but thank you so much, guys. This has been inspiring. Um, for those of you who have listened, thank you for being patient with us. Uh, you can find, I'm sure, everyone here on LinkedIn. I'm also on LinkedIn myself, Chike Okebu. Um, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, there was something that Namda pointed out that I wanted to, you know, hammer on. And that's knowing how to turn down capital that is not good. There is a thing as toxic capital, right? Um, I sat down with some VC at Startup 52, which is a tech accelerator. We work with startup founders. And we have all these VCs who come in and they have all these sessions and they walk away, right? And I was having a conversation with a VC um, about an idea. And this dude was the one who reached out, hey, I want to take this meeting. And here we are, 11 a.m. in the morning during COVID. I don't wake up before one. Um, and this dude is not prepared for the meeting we're supposed to have. I'm like, dude, wait, you asked for a meeting and you show up to this meeting unprepared. This is a waste of my time. Yes, we're asking you for money, but I also need to know how to hold you accountable because you're not going to stand here and waste my time, right? So know how to defend who you are and defend what you represent. It's extremely important. Vivian, I look forward to, you know, all of the tech crunch and the Forbes and, you know, all the articles talking about another black woman, but more importantly, another Igbo woman who has raised over a million dollars. Kudos to the work you're doing. Charles, kudos to the work you're doing. Hopefully we can talk about, you know, some collaboration in Hollywood and all that great stuff. And then Namde, I'm coming for you as well, right? So we have to talk about getting more Igbo people into corporate America, but more importantly, teaching more people how to build generational wealth. Uh, to you, are you? Uh, to you, are you? Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I know we're so sort of five minutes over time. Uh, this has been exciting. We look forward to um, other inspiring events like this. And um, yes, and of course, to next year. Someone said, last, last, we all go hammer. All right. Mona, Mona, say well, love. Thank uh, you so Mona. much, Chike. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Everyone, Chike, it's such a pleasure to hear from you, honestly. And our distinguished panel, I believe our next set of accomplished panelists and business leaders are in this conference room <coughs> right now. And I look forward to seeing what the future holds for all of us. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Vivian Namdi. Charles, again, you guys were amazing. Thank All you. the best in your endeavors, especially during this time, okay? That one, no. Thank you. Do you see me, K.O.?